Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, today we have the pleasure to have Bojack Kovarik. Um, this is going to talk about game theory with simulation of other players. Uh, for those of you who don't know Vodja already, Vodja is a postdoctoral researcher at Carnegie Mellon University's Foundation of Cooperative AI Lab. And before that, he obtained his PhD in pure, pure mathematics and led the transition to researching algorithmic game theory and AI. And during his previous postdoctoral position at Czech Technical University in Prague, he worked on solving building two player uh, two players zero sum in perfect information games. And he, in his current research, he focuses on leveraging game theory to mitigate the risks associated with advanced AI systems. Uh, something that is like very, very cornerstone in, in current developments on, on machine learning and AI. So without any further ado, uh, Vodja, you have your, your time. All right, perfect, uh, thanks. Um, yeah, first, a practical matter. I think this will be more fun and work better. Uh, if we have questions during the talk. So whenever something is unclear to you, uh, just feel free to um, raise your hand or just uh, unmute yourself and speak out and ask. Um, I have a bunch of content, some of the, which we can skip uh, if uh, we instead end up talking about something more specific. All right. Uh, and regarding the talk, uh, I'm going to be presenting in particular results from a recent paper, which is called literally what the title of the talk is called. Uh, and this is a joint work with uh, my two co-authors, Kasper Osterheld and Vince Kolitzer. Um, but I'm also going to be talking about, more generally about the agenda of, uh, of our lab, which is perhaps even more interesting, I think, than, the, than a specific paper. Um, we are talking about here. Sorry. And um, the plan for today is to first talk about the general agenda, then talk about open source theory, um, which is like a specific, can be viewed as a specific part of this uh, agenda, um, a bit about prior work, and then about the current paper. And finally, I'll talk about some like exciting new open problems here. Uh, sadly, I don't have uh, time to work on all of them. so. Uh, maybe somebody else uh, will be able to. All right. Um, so first, uh, the motivation for all of this uh, is what we call like foundations of cooperative AI. And here the motivation is that game theory has been invented um, primarily for modeling interactions between humans. Maybe also companies, but like still companies running on humans. But now we'll have a lot of AIs running around. Um, so there is, they're gonna be interacting with each other and with humans. And maybe you should ask some important questions such as like, does the presence of AI change how we should be looking at game theory? And if so, how? Um, second, like maybe those models that we used in game theory, they're not going to be like wrong or anything, but maybe they might be outdated for some of this, and maybe we should update them um, to account for AI. And finally, since we are not just doing this for the sake of curiosity and fun, even though this is fun and interesting, we have an agenda here, which is to make sure that. Uh, it's easier to build AIs that are cooperative and nice and beneficial and all of those. All right. Um, so let's talk about some some ways in which AI could make game theory different. So um, some aspects of this are like um, interacting with identical copies of yourself. You could always think about thought experiments like what if you are in a prisoner's dilemma with an identical copy of yourself um, but like that's not actually ever going to happen it's just a thought experiment but with ai it literally could happen you could have a like whatever another robot here that is running the exact same source code as you another uh, thing like this could be imperfect recall or just like messing around with the AI's memory. 
you could put the give the AI fake memories. You could wipe its memory such that it uh, it doesn't know in which situation it is. And again, this is something that's already happening to like Chat GPT million times a day. Um, it could be happening to other AIs as well. And maybe we could like sometimes use it for our purposes uh, to, to do some whatever uh, things that wouldn't be doable otherwise. Um, and a third thing that I'll mention right here is um, that the AI and that this talk is going to be about uh, is that the, if you are an AI, you could share your source code with other people. So that means that other people will be able to perfectly predict what you are going to do. Um, but you will still be playing like game theoretical interactions with those people. And now, how does this kind of game theory look like? That's the question. Um, maybe at this point, I would like ask um, just everybody if you have thoughts on like what other aspects of um, of AI could make uh, could make game theory different. Um, I guess you can like randomly type them into chat. We can spend like a couple of minutes uh, talking about this uh, before going on. So if if you have like any any ideas for how AI might importantly change game theory, uh, what do you think that could be? And maybe to get this, to nudge this, I can volunteer Manfred. Um, what do you think? Uh, what do you think are some things like that? All right. AI systems that are actually designed to maximize expected value as opposed to humans, which are just uh, boundedly rational or biased or whatever. And computation of solutions made faster, so you can be playing closer to Nash, or closer to Nash or whatever. Uh, intrinsic motivation objectives in game theory. Uh, do you wanna expand on that a little bit? I, I don't know what to imagine under that. So the, um, usually, in, in these interactions, like the, the, you consider in game theory, you have outcomes and and the outcomes usually have like a, an extrinsic value to or intrinsic a value on on these players. Uh -huh. uh, but in reinforcement learning, there is all this theory of like intrinsic motivation, and agents are intrinsically motivated to do different stuff that is just not maximizing some intrinsic reward. So, this, uh, what is the perspective of like how game theory would look like when when you're sort of like improving against yourself or like a version against yourself sort of saying like you're trying to control environments or this sort of stuff so mm -hmm. yeah that's like just random thoughts yeah, yeah yeah okay simulations of different rationalities we can now simulate different incentives and learn to adapt yeah sure um i know one uh, many human values term many human value terms are vague and as such it's hard for AI to understand the instructions in the way that humans expect it. Yeah, sure. I oh, know. Um, yeah, I'll just, uh, okay. And it can help exploit some things in opponent strategies and make a step to understand human behavior. Yeah. Um, again, just, uh, I think there's a bunch of stuff here, just some random other things that I thought about. These three I already mentioned. And then the agents could like explicitly modify their own goals, uh, which might sometimes be helpful. Like instead of promising you to cooperate with you, I could just like change my utility function to want to cooperate with you. Or I can I could spawn sub agents. Maybe if I want to negotiate with you in a way that reveals uh, in a way where you reveal some private information to me that you don't want shared, well, I can't, like, in in, in real life with humans, I cannot uh, very well, like, take an underlying uh, 
can take an employee, have them negotiate with you, and then because the employee knows secret information, then I shoot the employee. Not a good idea. But like with AIs, we could like spot an AI and then delete it without revealing the secret info. Um, and again, maybe like just because everything is happening faster, this could be like qualitatively different. All right. So this just shows that like there is a whole bunch of stuff uh, that that's different. Uh, maybe some of this will change how we should think about things, um, and it would be good to have like ways of thinking about this formally, such that we can utilize like get the most out of all of this. All right, so that's the motivating agenda here. Mm. And now I will zoom in on a specific thing, which is this open source game theory. So, um, to talk about the, the setting, um, you'll be assuming that one agent A knows another agent's source code. Or, and, and then um, that means that the, the agent can predict what the other agent will do, for example, by running this other agent in a simulation, in like a black box simulation. Uh, sandbox simulation, or alternatively, you can like look at the code and reason about it, or maybe run some verification tools or whatever. Um, and open source theory, game theory, further assumes that like both agents can do this. So just uh, as an informal setting, and there are some other um, settings that are like not quite this, but uh, similar to this in the spirit. So maybe one agent knows the other agent really well. So like, I don't know, my, my sister would be able to tell pretty well what, what I'm going to do ahead of time, or maybe my therapist or somebody who has access to all of my data and can run good machine learning algorithms on it. Um, other ways this could work is, is if one agent is an institution, that has published its policy. So there is still a lot of like wiggle room for what the humans in the institution will actually do, but the institution is bound by the rules a bit. And maybe another setup is, is if, if, if you are a company and I have spies in your company. So I there is a decent chance that if you change your decision, um, I will know about it. And all of this uh, corresponds to some like prior work. Well, some of this. Mm -hmm. And finally, the agent, this is related to like, if, if you can make credible commitments, which is uh, the traditional Stackleberg games formalism. Um, all right. Now, to talk about the existing work bar, um, we'll be assuming that the agents, each agent sees the other agent's code but kind of analyzing this code is for free. This is what the most of the literature assumes. So how one way how to imagine this is we have this uh, some game, let's say uh, a prisoner's dilemma, and we have here Alice and Bob playing the game, but they are not playing the game directly. Instead, each of them make a robot, they put some program in the robot, and then basically it's the robot's programs that are competing. So now, the outcomes are just going to be outcomes in the game, but the actions are programs, not the outcome, uh, not the uh, not not nor not the normal actions. And we'll be assuming that the program is not just a function of the game, but it also looks at the other program. So it's just like whatever formally formal definition. The important part here is that is that the programs are a function that looks at the game and the other program and outputs an action. Um, so how this actually looks like if we imagine it as a normal form game, we could imagine these like um, uh, programs that are oblivious to what the other agent is doing, which is just like return cooperate or return defect. And these together interact as normally. But could also have more advanced programs like look at the other program and if it's this like kind of cooperate rock program 
just always cooperates, then cooperate and with everybody else defect. Um, and a bunch of other things. Um, okay. And now people looked into how to achieve cooperation in these, uh, in these kinds of games. One way to do it would be just to see like what kind of, um, like look at what the other program is doing. We'll look at what it's, what it is. And a particular version of it is like this cooperate with copies. Pretty simple thing It's like, look at the other program and if it's the same as you, then cooperate. Um, and now this turns out to be uh, a Nash equilibrium where if, if you know the other agent is going to do this, uh, use this program, you would also want to use this program. Um, by Nash equilibrium, I mean Nash equilibrium in the program game. So this is a Nash equilibrium, but it's like, I would say it's like the, the ultimate xenophobic equilibrium. It's like, I only cooperate with people who are literally identical to me. Um, and like, if you format your program slightly different, or if you write the same program in a different programming language, then I defect against you. So this is like very brittle, not nice, not what we should be doing. So the question is, what do we do instead? Um, um, but before going to that, um, let me mention two two like properties of these games. Um, one is going to be just like these program games. Do not like replace game theory. Normal game theory is still gonna be a thing. And then we are gonna have a Falk theorem. So the first thing is that if you have some game and a normal Nash equilibrium in that normal game, then if you just have these programs which don't even look at the other program, just they just do what the original Nash equilibrium would do then this is also an Nash equilibrium, even in the program game, which kind of makes sense. This is like, if you are assuming that your opponent isn't going to look at your program at all, even though they could, well, then you might as well like also not bother. And so it's like all of Nash equilibria from the original game transfer to the program game. Um, and then we are going to have a result which is kind of uh, maybe good maybe dead that's the Falk theorem um, well this is just gonna say uh, this just says that anything that's achievable in the game as a convex combination of the outcomes and that's better than mm, the minimax value so like everybody uh, you doing the best you can while everybody else is out to get you. So any outcome like this is realized in some program equilibrium. Um, and this is the idea behind this is a bit similar to this cooperate with copies thing, except you would just be like, you are assuming that everybody else is coordinating on a particular outcome. Um, and if they are, then you just also coordinate on this outcome. But if they try to do anything else, then everybody just tries to screw this one person over as much as they can. Um, and then this is the kind of the same situation that you have in standard fault theorems for repeated games. So this is like anything can be, uh, pretty much anything can be an equilibrium. So for example, here in, in the normal prisoner's dilemma, Sure, you could have the corporate, corporate, corporate equilibrium, but maybe there's also an equilibrium where both players just get like 4.1, like nearly as bad as defect, defect. Or maybe you could have another equilibrium where one of the agents uh, gets gets nearly all of the benefits. Uh, okay. Does that make sense so far? Any questions? Yeah, just one question. How does this differ from, so what is the difference between a program and for instance, things that people use in empirical game theory as like meta strategies 
Uh, oh. so how, how do you see a program different from a strategy in in a, in a, in a game? What is it? What would be like? The a, you mean in a normal? Sorry, I don't know. I'm in a normal from game, like, like the in a normal. Oh, okay. It's the strategies are a function of the other player's strategy, kind of. Here, so you can. If that makes sense, does it? Yeah, does it answer the question? Um, I, I can ask it later. I think there is okay, another okay. question. Yeah, okay, yeah, maybe it will be clearer once we go over some more. Yeah, more sure. uh, Merit? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so I, I have a related question to what Manfred asked, so maybe I can ask now. I was going to ask, uh, what do we gain by like going into program games and like solution concepts like program equilibrium compared to just using like a learning in games approach where we have history conditioned mixed strategies that sort of depend on the history of what other agent has done in the past. You can condition on that and still have a probability distribution instead of just like going down the source code level, right? Because yeah, yeah. is there yeah, like a point. benefit at the source code level? Perfect. I think what we gain is you don't need to history. This can work in one shot. Uh, this, of course, we get the kind of negative results here that like whatever was equilibrium before is still an equilibrium. But you get these new equilibria, cooperate, cooperate is one of the equilibria, even if you play this one shot. So that's, I think, the main result, main difference. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because I just wanted to know, like, a met meta strategy wise, you can just say, well, the other agent is doing fictitious play. And that's all I need to know. I don't really actually know how it implements fictitious play, right? I think, but I'm not able to think. I'm not sure, uh, right? Now. I'm not good at thinking on the spot. So um, I think the answer is yes. Uh, right. Um, yeah. Let's go to the next examples, and um, we can talk more if uh, if things are still unclear. Then. Uh, okay. So, okay. Another way you could try to achieve cooperation in these program games would be like via let's call this simulation. So the idea would be that you try to simulate the other program, run it in a sandbox, and then cooperate if and only if it cooperates. So you, know, you could try something like the following, like if other program uh, that sees our program returns cooperate, then we cooperate, otherwise we defect. Um, but now the question is, what do you think this will do against itself? Again, let's take like, uh, I don't know, 30 seconds. Um, to come up with what you think will happen here. Um, you can write it in the chat, uh, just to commit to your answer. What will this do against if you run it against itself? Yep, all right. I guess this is too obvious, uh, indeed. Infinite recursion. This does not terminate. Um, so we have a problem here, but let's try to fix this idea. Mm, this would be, I think, Casper's result. Uh, just like with probability epsilon, you don't even look at the other program, you just cooperate. And now with probability one minus epsilon, well, just otherwise, you run the other program with, that sees your program uh, and do what this other program will do. And again, this is, the question is like, what, what does this do against itself? And this cooperates with, like, with probability one. Uh, and I think it's like an equilibrium uh, so this is this is good. We get like cooperate. Uh, it's gonna be an equilibrium. 
it's gonna um, cooperate with itself but the good thing is that this no longer uh, depends so much on the implementation details like the thing from before uh, yes hey um, so in the second case it doesn't even return defect ever yeah uh, well sorry no if if this is playing against a like program that always defects, then it would defect. But if it were playing against itself, um, yeah. and it doesn't it have the option to defect. Yes, correct. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, this is uh, supposed to be like, or this is supposed to be and is more robust uh, than before. And kind of, I don't know, my, my, my like high level intuition here or like why the first thing doesn't work and the second thing works is if you're doing this like thinking about what the other agent is thinking about you thinking la 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 then all of this reasoning must be like well founded it needs to bottom out somewhere no infinite chains of reasoning and this this epsilon here allows you to achieve this um like again this is like just a big intuition Sorry, is that like a, a variant of bounded rationality? Is at some point you stop like uh, stochastic? Second, it's like at some point you stop like trying to figure out what the other will do. Yeah, I, I suppose this seems relevant. I think again, I'm not saying any anything formal here. This is just like a intuition you can have here. It, this would be like all the computation need to. All the computation in practice are bounded, so you can't just be reasoning uh, infinitely about the other player. Um, all right. And now uh, there is there's also another line of work um, for this, which is to achieve cooperation in the, these program games by reasoning about the other agent. Um, and the idea that people here have here is that you you would like cooperate if and only if you can prove that the other agent will cooperate against you. Um, uh, how does this work? It's, there is this like, well, basically it's what I just said, but it's like uh, it's this algorithm called defect unless proof of opponent cooperation, DUPOC, and it look, looks at the other program and then if it can find a proof in piano arithmetic that the other program cooperates then it cooperates of course this is like theoretical it's not like anybody has like efficient uh, actual implementation for part of this for real world things but um, it shows that maybe it makes sense to even look for things like that um well, okay, doesn't show it yet. Might show it soon. Um, so the question here is, what do you think this will do when it's playing against itself? Right? This will like um, this will cooperate if the other player is a cooperate rock. It will defect if the other player is a defect rock, like rock written with, with defect written on it. Um, but the question: What do you think this will do? against itself and uh, again feel free to write guesses in the in the chat yes can, can, can you uh, uh restate what what line once means what line oh okay that means yeah. sorry thanks yeah it's yeah, yeah, it's like yeah. piano arithmetic this is this is like it searches yeah. over proofs uh, again not compute i don't know probably not comp not practically computable name, but searches over proofs to see if the other pro uh, if the other agent cooperates uh oh, sorry maybe let me let me give a bit more intuition here it's like player one is reasoning like if i can prove that player two cooperates then i'll also cooperate in the meantime the other player is like if I can prove that the first player cooperates, then then I will cooperate. And and like um, question is, do they cooperate? Can you then prove that they'll? Um, 
um, just feel free to be put like some guesses or like I have no clue. This is weird. Um, just what do you think? All right. Uh, okay, we got uh, people seem to have registered uh, their guesses. So yes, my intuition would also be that this is again infinite recursion, but it turns out that no, this cooperates. In this setup, you can actually prove that this cooperates. Um, I'm not going to go into details, but it's like um, a thing called Labs Theorem, which I understand only partially which shows that like, whatever, I'll not go into it, but it's like, it's not that complicated. It's just that I don't know how to explain it well, but it's not that complicated. And like magic happens and this cooperates. Um, so this is a way of like going around this infinite recursion, which is uh, was pretty surprising to me. All right. Um, so it's time. Uh, Let's go to the actual content of the paper, um, which we'll be assuming that uh, the simulation is uh, one-sided, only one player can simulate the other, but unlike the previous work, we'll be assuming that this costs you something. So the setup is like there is a Alice and there is some robot. The robot is like has some source code, so it's already clear what it's going to do, except Alice doesn't know it and she can decide to pay some money, and then she'll know what exactly the robot is going to do. Um, so formally, we'll be assuming that the robot is deter using a uh, pure strategy. So, um, or maybe it's using a, yeah, I'm sorry. The robot is uh, a pure strategy, so we'll be able to predict it. Um, so, um, but now, it would be kind of boring to as to be assuming that like um, the robot is thinking that they're going to be playing a normal game and it's choosing its strategy to fit that. And in the meantime, Alice actually knows she can like just pay this money, figure out what the robot is going to do, and then best respond. That I mean, that that could sometimes happen, but it's just like maybe not very stable and also boring and. So instead, we are going to assume that the either the robot or its designer is aware of the simulation being possible. So not this. Um, and I think maybe the, if, one of the takeaways here is just like how to think about one way of thinking about this. Uh, so how we are going to be thinking about is this like this. There is going to be like, let's say, some robot factory out of which will roll out a specific robot. And then it's already determined what the robot's going to do. And that robot will interact with Alice. But before Alice interacts with the robot, she can choose to pay some money and simulate the robot. And, and now crucial part of this is that there is in, in the factory, there is some designer which is strategically thinking about this and going like, Will Alice simulate the robot or not? And which robot should there should I make, therefore? And similarly, Alice is like, do I simulate? And what kind of robot will they do? Will they make? So most of the interesting game theory will be happening here on the top level. So this is a game between the, the simulator and the designer of the AI. So simulator's action space is going to be like, either they don't simulate and they just then their options are whatever their options were originally, or they can simulate, and then their action is like simulate and choose a response policy. Um, though we are going to be assuming they're just the best responding here. And the designer's action space is just like the robot designs, which is like the policies for the games. But both of them will actually be using, be able to mix over these actions. As, as, as you usually can. So to look at a specific example, 
um, we have this game here. Um, so Alice has a bunch of money that she wants to invest, but she doesn't know how to invest. Bobble is a company that makes AI investor assistance. So that means Alice could hire this robot and then the robot will make 50,000 in profits, let's say, and they split this 50-50. So it's like a 25 for Alice, 25 for, for Bobble. But now there is this like, there is this ugly part here with minus 100 for Alice. And this means that the Bobble can also give her a malicious AI, which will just steal all of the money. And like, whatever, the slate, state of AI regulation being what it is, AI, Alice will know exactly what happened, but she won't be able to do anything about it, let's say. And we are not assuming any reputation effects and such. Um, okay. Now, the problem with this setup is the Nash equilibrium of this game is for Alice to, to expect that she'll be screwed over. So she'll not trust Bubble. And if she did trust them, they would just defect. Okay. And Bobble doesn't like this either. So they'll show Alice the AI source code in hopes that she will then be able to trust. So we have this, but, but then we have the issue that Alice is neither an investor nor a programmer. So she doesn't under, she's not able to just for free and analyze the AI. She needs to hire a programmer, which costs her something. So that we get this second game on the uh, here where at the start, Bobble decides which robot to use. Uh, Alice then decides to simulate. And if she doesn't, we are back in the original game. But if she does, then she'll be able to just best respond. Um, does that make sense? Any questions for this? All right. I'll assume yes, but feel free to ask. Um, so, just to just to show what I how this generalizes, if or how to maybe do this computationally. If we have some matrix game here, um, and we add one more row, which in for each action, and how how do you determine the utilities? Well, for each action of the of player uh, of the column player player two. You figure out what's the best response of player one. So if they cooperate, you trust. If they defect, they walk out. And then uh, the utilities here are uh, the same utilities, except you had to pay the simulation cost, which is seven in this case. So this works for like any matrix game, as long as you assume you have some like uh, Tie breaking policy for uh, policy for how to do tie breaking when you're best responding. Um, okay, and what happens in this particular case? Uh, so, like, what are the Nash equilibria? Um, so, sadly, the, the the bad original bad equilibrium is still going to be an equilibrium. So, bubbles can st still be like providing you malicious agents, in which case you will not bother to simulate, you will just walk out. Um, however, we also have a new equilibrium. And now what, what is that? First, we should like note that um, Bobble always cooperating cannot be an equilibrium. Like Bobble always cooperating, Alice always simulating, that can't be an equilibrium. Because like if Bobble always cooperates, then Alice has no reason to simulate. She she should she could save those seven thousand um, by not simulating. But as soon as she stops simulating, Bobble would like start defecting. So this isn't going to work out. But we have a new equilibrium, which is that Bobble will sometimes defect, which will force Alice to be a bit paranoid and sometimes simulate. But sometimes she'll just trust. Um, like more precisely here, are kind of the probabilities. Um, so uh, the important bit here is that as the simulation cost goes to zero, um, Bobble will start defecting less and less. And here are the utilities, which means like Bobble 
just kind of doesn't care. They are already getting all of the benefits of cooperation here. But uh, Alice would prefer the simulation cost to be low. Um, and like, of course, this only works if the simulation cost is low enough. Um, I'm going through the specific example, but uh, in the paper we show that like this kind of thing holds more generally. So um, I'll talk a bit more about it later. But, uh, and so we should ask like, did simulation help? So, like, the new Nash equilibrium isn't part to optimal. So, like, we're not, it's not like this is, like, as great as it possibly could. But it's still better than the old, old equilibrium. The old equilibrium was, like, 0, 0. So, 16, 25 is better. Um, you could also look at it from another angle. You could complain that, like, you know, Nash equilibrium is just, like, a stupid concept. Why doesn't, like... Why doesn't Bobble just commit to cooperating? Or like, why doesn't Alice just like commit to simulating always, right? Like if Alice always simulated, Bobble would always cooperate. So, so Alice would be getting this like 18, which is better than 16 over here. So you could argue this, um, but if you look at it from this point of view, then imagine that we originally had this like trust uh, that originally you could be looking at like why doesn't Bobble just like always cooperate and Alice always trust um, and this is very unstable outcome like this this would be like being here this 25 25 and Bobber has this like really big temptation to switch to defecting and like gain 125 in utility so that's like very unstable and this new thing gives you this new outcome where Alice could be always simulating, bubble always cooperating. This is still not an equilibrium, but uh, it's, and it also is unstable because like Alice has this temptation to stop simulating uh, and, uh, and gain seven, but it's like, it's much less unstable than before. So like, you could also look at it from like, if you look at like approximate equilibrium, then uh, then this helps by like decreasing the Nash the gap exploitability whatever of uh, of the nice outcomes. Um, all right, and then kind of like just what are the main results that we show in the paper? Um, we define generalized trust games. It's supposed to be like kind of game sorry games kind of like these but more general by which I mean um, that you have a game where if you gave player to commitment power, then this would in improve the outcome for both players over like Nash equilibrium in the original game. Um, does this definition make sense? Just intuitively. Yes. Uh, by commitment power, do you mean going to, let's say, Stackelberg equilibria then? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, this would uh, accept, I mean, pure, sorry, yeah, good good point. I meant uh, player two is going to be Stackelberg, Stackel, Stackelberg leader, except uh, they're not going to be committing to a mixed strategy, but to a pure one. So, like, if player two was committing, credibly committing to a pure strategy. Um, I think, but, but, but we still have hierarchical play then now. It's not simultaneous play. Yeah, it's not simultaneous. So it's like, in these generalized trust games, it's not like you actually play, no, it's not like players who actually is a Stuckerberg leader, but it's like a game where if they were, it would help both players. They're kind of trying to promise player one that like, hey, I'm going to do this nice thing, and player one is, like, yeah, if only I could trust you, that would be great. But they can't. Um, all right. And then we show that if in these games, adding simulation helps both players. Uh, and adding simulation is like, so this is like obviously kind of by definition, if you turned this into this like uh, 
pure commitment stack library game, then that would by definition help. But the difference here is that like layer two does not know whether they're being simulated or not. So they have this temptation to cheat. Mm, or like player one has the temptation to not simulate and player two has the temptation to cheat. Um, okay, and then we also show that there are some games where, sorry, so these are games where simulation helps. There are also games where simulation only helps one player or the other play and hurts the other or, or like uh, helps the simulator, hurts the other player or helps the other player, helps the simulator. There are even games where simulation hurts both players. Um, kind of if you need whatever, um, it's in a paper. And we show that in general, figuring out whether simulation helps or not is hard. And, and whatever, then there are a bunch of other results. Um, and maybe to hint at some of the future work, um, this was assuming this like one-sided simulation. Um, if we wanted to think about mutual simulation, then one way we could think about this is so like we have this original setup where Alice here is thinking like, do I simulate or not? And maybe secretly, like let's say they have a super psychologist in the company that can like try to analyze Alice and figure out whether she's gonna simulate or not. Um, and then maybe maybe you could think about setup where like Alice, even before she like encounters this whole situation, is thinking about like, oh, will they try to do this like mind games on me or not. Um, so you would have like the same interaction that was happening here, you would have it like one level higher. And you could go on like this. Um, and, uh, and this is not something we have uh, worked out yet, but uh, I strongly suspect it would will work. So just some like speculation here. So like we, we could think about like, adding simulation levels like this, if it makes sense in the in a particular situation. But in this way, we'll never obtain truly mutual simulation like in the program games. There is always gonna be like someone on top that's not being simulated like, like here. Like here it was Alice, here it's that like psychologist that's Predict like simulating whether Alice is going to be simulating. Um, but so it's it will never never be fully mutual like in the programmers. But also recall that like that that example I gave earlier with like when we tried to like simulate the other program and cooperate if and only if it cooperates and this didn't terminate. So it's like we never achieved this like full mutual understanding either in, in this approach either. So like maybe these two lines of work might be like more related than it initially seems. Again, I don't know, but it seems like a promising to look into. Mm. And, and I'll also mention like one, one worry that I have about this line of work. Uh, one reason why it might not be as, as cool as I hope, um, or like one thing to be wary about, is like, question, can we even create simulations that it will be impossible to distinguish from reality? Like, if, uh, like, assuming the worst case opponent is like arbitrarily smart and will try to figure out whether they are being simulated or not, can you then create a convincing simulation? And like my my guess, my strong guess here is that like just definitely not. This is this is like totally not doable. Maybe theoretically, but in practice, just no. Um, some intuitions for this. Um, what the agent can do, just like practically, what the agent can do is like look for glitches, inconsistencies, things that are illogical, um, and in practice there's like pretty good chance you will have forgotten about some tiny detail. Um, 
but maybe even more than Ningling, your computer, your simulation is going to be computationally bounded, whereas the real world like isn't, um, or is much less computationally bounded. So if the agent wants to like be sure that it's like sometimes um, wants to have some way of detecting reliably um, simulation that they are in a simulation. Uh, sorry, they are in a real world. They can try things like, can I like break this brute force, this cryptographic thing, in a very short time? This is something that will be doable in some time in the future, but is not doable now, and is not doable in the simulation, perhaps. Um, or you can try other other things like that. Um, and this was like if you were relying on a on simulating, if you are instead relying on analyzing the code, then maybe the agent could be like, just, uh, this like a hundred thousands of code and somewhere in the corner, it will hide like the defective strategy or the, it will try to reason in like some weird decentralized ways. So it's just, this is just the intuition for like why this is hard in general. But I still don't think it's necessarily doomed because this is like bad news for both sides. In our examples, Bobble wanted to be able to be simulated. So like Bobble, the, the simulated agent might have some incentive to, to be simulatable. So like an open problem, how can we design agents that demonstrably don't even try to distinguish simulation in reality in a way that you can trust that they do this. All right, um, okay. And there's some fun stuff to do with large language models here that like kind of approximate this in a way that's less precise but more fun. But I think we don't have time for that. I guess we can instead go to some questions. Um, yeah, if you're interested in any of this, reach out to uh, either of us. We would be happy to talk. Yeah, thank you, Vodja. Uh, are there any questions? Um, I don't see. Not in the chat. Maybe Not in the chat. chat? Oh, yeah, we oh. do have one. What do we do if we don't have access to the source code of the other program? Um, I would say, well, well, the first answer is like nothing. This is not applicable. Um, but maybe some of this could be like still applicable if, if like you don't literally have access to the source code, but maybe you have uh, enough knowledge about the other agent such that you can like predict with high enough accuracy what they're going to do. Then maybe some of this will still apply. But in general, no, it this like re relies on the other agent wanting to share the source code with you. Mm, Manfred was first, I think. I think also Max. Oh, okay. <laughs> Max. Sorry, I meant to clap. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <Stay talking. laughs> Not the first time that happens. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, my question is like, it's sort of related to what Merd was asking before and some of the, that we were discussing at the beginning is that, well, what is the difference between, or what do you see that is the main difference of the new, uh, the main contribution between, um, thinking about this idea of open sourcing uh, other programs, for instance, neural networks, compared to other systems that we already have in place to sort of like control this like reputational problem, like uh, modeling past history of interactions, reputation systems, uh, this sort of stuff. Where, where do you see this line of open sourcing in theory being more useful than, for instance, I, I'm buying some model from Google and I know they're competent and they have like some reputation, so I, yeah, I, yeah. I trust them. So yeah, I this is. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that is very valid, uh, and I think that's one of the weaknesses of the like running example that we use. And in practice, if this was like a AI company, you would instead be relying on reputation instead of this simulation stuff. But I think like the use cases that this would help you with that the other stuff wouldn't would be either if you want to like do this in a more decentralized manner where you like don't necessarily trust the other party or you don't know the other party, um, then you could rely on this. 
Um, that would be one. And the other would be maybe with more advanced AIs, um, once, uh, if there is some decision that's like so high stakes that the reputation concerns are like not that relevant. Um, again, I'm, I, I'm not saying this would like out of the box be applicable to it, but maybe some of the intuitions um, might be. Uh, yeah, thanks for Polly. Does that answer? I'm gonna, yeah, yeah, that's, that's okay. actually. All right, and we, we are over time. I'm, uh, I'm gonna, go yeah. I'm, there are some questions, but I'm gonna stop the, the recording now. So to make mm -hmm. it like sharp at one, but yeah, people can yeah. feel free to. Yeah, I'm happy to say later.